Hello, I'm Andrew Bridgen. I'm the Reclaims Member of Parliament for North West Leicestershire. You may have noticed I've been making some noise in the place behind me lately about a, a novel medical procedure, a product that was given to a large number of people, myself included, which seems increasingly likely has caused more health problems than it's solved. Despite my best efforts, Nobody in this building behind me has been willing to discuss this vital issue in any meaningful sense. The few debates I have managed to arrange have been sparsely attended, ignored by most of your elected representatives. But this is not the first time Parliament has suppressed discussion of a disastrous drug rollout. We all think we know the story of thalidomide, how a miracle cure for morning sickness became one of the largest man-made medical catastrophes in history. But perhaps you don't know the dark origin story of this company that created the catastrophe. Chemigrunethal, the German pharmaceutical company behind the infamous drug thalidomide, has been subject to investigations regarding its alleged connections to the Nazi regime. Although these allegations may not be fully substantiated, there's considerable evidence linking the firm to former Nazi party members. Founded in the aftermath of World War II by Hermann Wurtz, Grunethal initially operated in a devastated post-war Germany. The company hired a number of scientists who were reportedly associated with the Nazi party during the war. Among them was Dr. Heinrich Muchter, who served as the company's chief scientist. Muchter had previously worked on anti-typhus efforts in Poland during the Nazi occupation. And although he was investigated for war crimes post-war, he was never convicted. Under Mukta's leadership, Grunethal developed and marketed thalidomide. Even before thalidomide's release to the public, it was given out free to staff, and the wife of an employee of the company gave birth to a baby without any ears. But the company, Grunethal, covered this up and moved on to marketing. Within two years, it's estimated that over a million West Germans were taking the drug on a daily basis. The first alarm bell sounded not from the pages of a medical journal, but from the sharp observations of a vigilant nurse, Sister Pat Sparrow. Night after night, Sister Sparrow, a nurse at Sydney's Crown Street Women's Hospital, was disturbed by an eerie pattern. Newborns, mostly from the practice of one Dr. William McBride, were being born with grievous limb deformities. Her heart ached for those innocent lives, their futures marred by the echoes of a silent epidemic. Amid the fear and confusion, one correlation emerged in her mind, thalidomide. Dr. McBride, unlike his peers, had recently begun prescribing this new miracle drug to alleviate the agonies of morning sickness. In a world that often overlooked the insights of nurses, Sparrow faced an uphill battle. Her initial warnings were met with scepticism and perhaps disbelief from Dr. McBride. But relentless in her pursuit of the truth, Sister Sparrow did not back down. The veil of doubt began to lift. Eventually, Dr. McBride could no longer deny the monstrous reality. Thalidomide, the supposed savior of expectant mothers, imparted a lifetime of suffering and death to their children. After McBride published an article in The Lancet in 1961, Grunethal withdrew thalidomide from the German market. Distillers, the British distributor, followed suit. And so began a long fight for justice that continues to this day. As the victims near retirement, their medical needs can only become more complex. In 1979, a battle in this fight was won when the European Court of Human Rights found that an injunction placed on newspaper reporting of the thalidomide tragedy was a free speech violation. But it was what the judge said about the House of Commons in paragraph 13 of the judgment that concerns me today. The speaker, he said, had repeatedly refused to allow any debate or question on the issues raised by the thalidomide tragedy. Repeatedly. And that is exactly what's going on today, as the questions about the medical intervention that so many of us have taken mount up. And the answers 
for the injured and the bereaved, they only have each other. So you see, questionable pharmaceuticals and complicit politicians and nothing new. In 1968, a criminal trial began in Germany of Grunenthal and a number of its employees. But there was high level political interference in this trial from the start. All charges were dropped when the company agreed to set up a compensation fund for the victims. In exchange, they were granted immunity from prosecution. So they bought their way out of trouble with a small fraction of their thalidomide profits. The story in South America demonstrates, though, the utter callous contempt for human life of the pharmaceutical industry. Sales in Brazil, for example, began after adverse events had already been reported in Germany and thalidomide wasn't withdrawn there until 1962, a year after it was pulled in Europe. Almost immediately, remarkably, thalidomide was back, approved in several countries, including Brazil, as a treatment for leprosy. And although measures were put in place to try and ensure pregnant women did not take it, these were difficult to enforce. A number of studies have found that thalidomide is still causing birth defects in Brazil up to our times. One in 2016 said new cases of thalidomide embryopathy are still being reported. Another in 2007 highlighted three new cases since 2005, but said this was probably underreported. Considering that these three cases were not registered through a systemic surveillance system, the authors said, but came to our attention through a series of coincidental random events, it can be assumed that the actual occurrence of affected babies by thalidomide continues to be as frequent as announced 10 years ago. In Spain, the reality, if possible, is even bleaker. The country was in 1961 still living under Franco's dictatorship. Grunethal claims that thalidomide was withdrawn there at the same time as it was elsewhere, but Spaniards were still being born with clear signs of thalidomide embryopathy until the early 1980s. The company has said this may be due to counterfeit thalidomide being sold in Spain and being beyond their control. But Avite, the group that represents victims in Spain, says different. They have obtained this letter, written, they say, in 1961 by Grunethal to their sister company in Madrid, advising that if they decided not to inform Spanish doctors about what was going on with thalidomide elsewhere, they would have the company's backing. In an interview with the BBC in 2016, Avite said that thalidomide remained on the official drugs register in Spain until 1975, long after Grunethal and the Spanish government knew exactly what that drug was doing to fetuses. This is the problem with Big Pharma. This is the morals of the people we're dealing with. They have a, a fiduciary duty to deliver profit for their shareholders. They have no fiduciary duty or obligation to give you, me or anyone else the correct and safe medication. It was 11 years between the withdrawal of thalidomide and the eventual debate in the House of Commons. I just hope it doesn't take that long this time around. Thank you very much for listening to me.